Today on Unpacked. He took my panties off and he was already naked under the blankets. So you went and confronted him. I needed to do a medical um, abortion because now the only thing that is standing between him and me is the fetus. possibly be harder to digest than hearing of a woman being raped in South Africa. Well, today's guest has her story to share. Let's unpack. Zizo Isabelo Zamapleni is a 25-year-old gender-based violence activist and a self-published author. Zizo was raised by her grandmother in the rural outskirts of Idujwa in the Eastern Cape. Her parents never married and her mother was often away working. When Zizo was seven years old, her father requested for her to move in with his family. However, Zizo's stay with her father and stepmom was not what she hoped it would be. This is her story. Let's unpack. Zizo, thank you so, so much for joining us via Videocon. Welcome to Unpacked. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure, Sislemo. Thank you so much. So let's start at the very beginning of your journey. What are some of your earliest childhood memories? Um, oh my gosh, I, I, I know that I, I grew up from my maternal side, mm. um, my mother's side of the family. It was a huge family full of love. Um, so it, those are the, the best memories that I just remember. My mom coming back from work because I stayed with my grandparents. Um, so she would bring me nice stuff. And just for the weekends, um, we had really a good time. And what was the family structure at that time that you ended up being raised by your grandparents? All right, Sislebo. So my parents were not married. Um, they met um, in college and I was born. Um, so my mom had to go back to school and she left me with um, my grandparents. So that was the family structure. Um, so she would come through. Um, she, she started working and then on weekends she would come to see me while I was living with my grandparents. Mm. So what was the next uh, pivotal or big change that happened in your life? All right. Um, my dad, um, we had already, um, they decided that um, both of them as my parents, that a child needed to have both parents in their lives. And so um, I started a relationship with my dad um, while living with my grandparents. So he would go and see me at school and everything like that. So we had a relationship. And so in the year 2001, I was seven, about to start grade one. He asked that I moved to Umtata because he lived in the urban area of Umtata. Um, so that I, I get good schooling and, 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 and so I went to live with him in Umtata. Mm. And then what happened after that? Um, so when I got to Umtata, he was, he had married someone else and, um, my half sister was born. And, but when I got there, I realized that my father was actually abusive towards my stepmother. And this carried on for months. Um, um, when, when it happened, I had to take the baby and run away with the baby to the next door neighbor and I would be called. Um, and then, yeah. So on this particular day, they had this huge fight that um, my mother, my stepmother, when they were done fighting, um, she came and took the baby with and she left. And on that night, my father raped me. So you, you mentioned that uh, you realized that your stepmother was actually being abused. What was the incident that happened that made you fully aware of what was going on? I, I cannot remember now, but I just remember um, we were playing outside and all of a sudden I hear my mother screaming, my stepmother screaming, and I'm like, oh, here we go again. But this time it was so out in the open um, that our neighbors was also um, were also called and I just took the baby and I just went to the neighbor's house. And then when it was all done, my Stepmother didn't even say anything to me. She just came, she took the baby, and she already had bag, um, bags packed, and she left. So at that time, um, it was just the four of you in the home, and she came and took your, your half-sister and left? Yes. Okay. And then what happened next? Um, so it was um, close to, to the evening, and... 
So my 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 stepmother has left with the baby and we're just sitting watching TV um, on top of the bed, my dad and I. And just all of a sudden, he just asked me to, to sit on top of him. And when I did, he took my panties off and he was already naked under the blankets and he just penetrated me and immediately turned um, me underside him and he continued with his act of raping me. Mm. While this was taking place, were you aware, and, and I'm keeping in mind you were seven years old at the time? Yes. Were yes. you aware that what he was doing was wrong or your mind was still confused? I, I was confused, but I was not aware what was happening was wrong. I was not aware. Mm -hmm. So then in, in that time, I mean, when he was done with the act of raping you, did he say anything to you to explain or to, to, to anything? Because at that time you were a child. No, he didn't say anything. Um, instead, he he just took me bridal style and went to put me in a in a bath full of cold water, and he washed me thoroughly. And um, he went to put me back into bed again, um, put me in nicely and warmly, and then he gave me pills. Um, and then the following morning, I wanted to go play, but I was in so much pain, and he asked that. Um, let's wait for the pain to subside. And he was busy giving me treatment like painkillers and all of that um, so that there's no more pain. And life just continued like that. Did you understand what the painkillers were for and what was causing the pain? No, I didn't understand. I was just given pills to stop the pain. That is what he said to me, that these pills will stop the pain that I'm feeling and I'll be fine. So your father, it's you and him alone in the house. The same person yes. that is causing your pain, you weren't aware at that time as a child that I'm in pain because of this thing that he did. No, I was not aware. Mm. I was not aware because I just didn't know what was happening. For me, um, even with other kids at school, I thought they were also going through the same thing. So I must also act like them because they are playing, you know. So mm. I must also become strong because other girls are going through this and maybe other boys. Just my mind didn't think that I was the only one going through that mm. at that time. Were there any other memories around that time in your life with your father raping you that still play back in your mind? Are there any, you know, distinct memories that come through for you? Um, no, not at all, because I, I wrote about it, I spoke about it, and I let it out of my mind, you know, mm. because um, I, I needed to unpack it for it to leave my mind. Yeah. So not anymore. There are many survivors of rape who share information of memories that have to do with things they smelled or things they saw. Some people will say, I, I remember the details in the ceiling or I was counting this or I could smell the cologne. You don't have any of those memories that still live with you? Um, I, I'm still, um, it, it's, it's just been recently that I was able to use um, Vaseline properly, you know, because mm -hmm. I knew that it was a, lubri a, a lubricant that was used to to help me um, to um, when when he's done with his act, he would take it and put it as an ointment, you know, mm. um, in my private part. Um, so it was just recently that I was able to use it for my mm. face, you know. Mm. Um, so yeah, those are the me memories I had stuck for a while. Mm. And the reason I ask is because so many survivors are triggered by things that seem mundane. So now you yes. know somebody might have a better understanding that's watching that oh, wow, now I can see why something that seems unrelated to anything can be triggering, that why are you being difficult not wanting to use uh, petroleum jelly? Why don't you want to use Vaseline? But this is a very real reality for you. Yes, definitely. Mm. Um, there's also a certain restaurant in South Africa that he used to take me to. Um, so that, that, that's also been a, a place that I haven't been able to go to for a while because I knew that once um, when, when he did this, that is where he used to take me and I would mm. play there. And mm. so those are the things that like, okay, maybe if I, if I come here now, this is a place to make me forget about things, you know? Yes. So that's how I knew the restaurant to be, a place to make me forget. Mm. So I had to deal with that um, for a while to make me understand that this is just a restaurant. He was the problem, not mm. the restaurant.
did he tell you that uh, he was doing it or you became aware later that that was part of the cycle? Um, okay, so he, he raped me for a period of seven years. Mm -hmm. um this continued um I, I i didn't live with him but whenever he had asked that i visit him for a weekend um he asked that i go so i started my period when i was 12 and i was told that if a boy would touch me i would get pregnant and i remember at boarding school um we were told the story of an uncle who was touching um his niece and everything like that so i i confronted him about it and he that's when the threatening started that no one would ever love me if I would ever talk about it and can I can you just, can I just take you back to how you confronted him yes um so, so you're saying was, um uh, sorry let me just take you even even a step further back so you're saying that at some point over seven years now you're 12 years old they're telling you uh, about this incident uh at boarding school that if an old an older person was touching somebody and then this happened. So you went and confronted him about what he was doing because at the time you weren't aware that what he was doing was wrong until you heard about it. Yes. So what, what yes. did that conversation um, sound like? Um, so I just I just told him that I had started my period and I was told that if a boy touches me, I will become pregnant. And that um, a story was read to me that um, if an uncle touches your private parts, um, it is wrong. And he became angry and he said that it's it, it's not what he was doing. It's not what he was doing. And that if I continue talking about this, then no one will love me. They will know that my parents, uh, my mom, and everyone in my family will know that I'm a child who tells lies. And yeah, so the conversation just ended there. And when you confronted him, uh, were you already of the belief that what is being done to you is wrong? Um, just when I when I heard about the story, then I knew that this was actually wrong. But in that story, I also tried to justify it because in that story, it was an uncle who was touching his niece. Mm. So for me, I was like, oh, okay, okay, maybe it's right because it's my dad, you know? So I was just having those battles with my mind because in a, in as much as maybe my mind knew that it was wrong, but I also had that clause that says, okay, but this is my dad, you know? So he had the right to do it. Mm, mm, mm. So now you confront him, he already says that people are going to accuse you of being a liar and um, no one's going to believe you. What happens after that? Um, after that, he still continues with um, raping me because I was there for the weekend and I, I go back home um, with clothes and uh, I think, yeah, with, with, with clothes because he had gone to buy me sports clothes and I had gone there um, so, yeah, life continued. Life continued until I had to visit him again, and still it continued. Mm -hmm. And in that time, um, the conversation never came up again? No, never again. Mm -hmm. So when did things eventually start to take a turn? Right. So the following year, in 2007, um, I, we were, I was in primary school, and it was my last year in primary school, and I was, um, he was going to buy me farewell clothes. Um, so I went to Umtata and he did the act again. And when I came back, um, I, I started becoming sick. So when I think about it now, I was actually having morning sickness. Um, so it happened that um, when I was at school, I had these um, uh, painful cramps and they took me to the hospital. And while I was there, the, the doctor um, performed tests on me. And later on, he decided, OK, we can't find anything wrong with her. So let us just do a pregnancy test because you never know. And it came out positive. But, and you were how old um, at this time? I was 13 years old. 13 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I didn't even know what pregnancy was. Um, I just went back to the boarding house and my mother was called to come in the following day to come and fetch me because they don't know how to deal with this. Mm. So um, my mom fetched me and the in the morning and she when she was angry and just, Zizo, how do you get pregnant at such a young age? You're a baby yourself, you know? And I'm like, um, mom, can you please just explain to me like what is pregnancy and mm. how does it happen? And that is when she explained to me that a boy does this and 
whatnot. And I was like, oh, what you, the act that you're explaining is what my dad actually does to me. Wow. What was mom's reaction? Mom's reaction was shocked. She was shocked and... But um, she she came, she was sitting in the front passenger seat and she came through and um, to the back seat where I was sitting and she was like, no, listen, um, this is no longer your battle to fight. This is no longer your luggage to carry. Mm. Um, um, it's mine now and I believe you. I know what mm. you are talking, what you are saying is true and we'll do whatever it takes to to make sure that justice is served. But even then, I didn't know what she was talking about, you know, because like, okay, you believe me and whatnot. And then all of a sudden calls are being made. We are going to the police station, you know. Um, so I, it didn't dawn to me until later on in life, like the following year when um, we were busy going to court. And, you know, so I was before like, you okay. get there, before you get there, you're saying that um, you went away, you know, maybe the gravity of the situation. You thought you're just telling yes. your mom, oh no, this is what happened and it, it was dead. Yes. And she's saying, I'm with you, I believe. You didn't understand how big this was. What did you think she meant? I don't know, really. I really don't know because I just thought like, okay, I believe you. I be, maybe I believe that you are pregnant. I I, I don't know. Mm. Um, I just, life was just normal for me. Um, so when we're like, okay, what? We are going to the police station. Okay, um, just the how because everything happened so fast. Everything mm. happened so fast for. Me. Mm, mm. So when they when she took you to the police station, um, do you remember them treating you with kindness? Did they treat? the situation with the sensitivity needed because we all hear the horror stories of having to go and report uh, a rape case at the, the SAPS. Yes, definitely. I remember that um, there were a couple of um, um, police officers that were there, um, but they were all battling, no, a female must take this, a female must take the statement. And she was so sweet, like she was so, in as much as she was also shocked because my mother, also for her, it was the first time that she heard that, what, this has been started, this has um, started happening like seven years ago, you know? Yeah. And I was saying, no, it didn't just start now, um, that weekend that I was there, it started a long time ago, like, yeah. so it was just a shock for the people that were in the room with me. It was the police officer and my mom. So, but she was so sweet about it, like holding my hand and just letting me remember everything and speak clearly. Do you recall in, in, in the moments that you were relaying the story, what you were going through emotionally? No. I, I I I had no emotions. Like I was just shocked about okay, what why why are we doing this? Mm. I, I no one explained to me, Ukuti, okay, Zizo, you were raped, and this is what it means to be raped and all of that, you know. So I was just when they told me, okay, take off your panties, go and pee. Um, this is what we are going to. I was just going with the flow with with what they were telling me yeah. as adults, you know. So I didn't know what was being meant by all of that that was happening. So nobody actually explained to you that uh, we need you to, to, to go and do this, 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 because it's part of a rape kit or we're trying to collect evidence. None of that. You were just following instructions that were being told to you. None of that was explained to me. Mm -hmm. So what happened next? Um, so um, the, the police officers decided that they had to go and... Um, arrest him the same day, you know, when I, 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 I spoke about it and they did that. And we went back home. We went back home and um, we were told that we had to come back now. Um, where they will hear what he has to say. And then we, we went back home and we heard that he is actually denying it. So um, we were then called um, by the prosecutor to tell us that... Um, I needed to do a medical um, abortion because now the only thing that is standing between him and me is the fetus that needed to be tested to find that he really did do this. Wow. So, so they were saying to you that you needed to, to, to do an abortion because they needed that yeah. as evidence because obviously if it turns out with the paternity test or DNA test that it's his child, then it is confirmation of what you are saying. Yes. I think I'm dumbfounded because your word was not enough. 
Was an abortion mm. something that was already considered by you and your family prior to uh, the prosecuting authority or the NPA uh, actually advising mm. this? I don't know. I don't know. Um, but even before that could happen, I had a miscarriage. So it ended up being his word against mine eventually. Mm. And they, they couldn't do a paternity test or DNA test on the, on the, on the fetus? Um, they couldn't do it because um, we went there, um, I was still bleeding and they just did a, a, a cleaning or whatever. And then they said that a sample, a bit of a sample was taken to Cape Town and we waited for like for over four months for that to come back. Um, and then there were just a lot going on. Another prosecutor said there were the results were positive. And then we went get there again, they said they were negative. So there's, there was just a lot going on with mm. that. But it ended up them saying that it, the, the, the results could not be used because there was nothing to use. So basically it was like inconclusive. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So Zizo, what happened next? Um, so after that, um, the, the, the case started, me going to court and everything like that. And what was worse for me at that time was that he was a very well-known person in the area and women were outside picketing for his innocence. And we were there with my mother looking also wrong and everything like that. And people were just outside the court saying that he never could have done this because people knew our relationship outside of the home. And yeah. he was always telling people that this is my daughter, this is my firstborn daughter, you know. So people knew me where I was, he was there. So there was just no way that he could have done that mm. in people's eyes. And uh, during this time, was he out on bail? Did you have to, you know, deal with him while the while the court case was happening yes he was out on bail and how did how did you and your family cope with that at that time um it was very difficult because you could be walking down the street and you see him you know so it was it was just difficult like that and um he he used to make calls and you know just him threatening us that listen, um, this will not will not take you anywhere, what you are doing. Let's sit down as a family and discuss this. You know, there are better ways. Um, so it was just the whole lot of dealing with that. Mm. And what was he suggesting are better ways? Um, that we sit down as a family and talk about it mm -hmm. and see what he can, he can pay or something like that. What he can pay? Yes. Like in the form of money, like damages? Yeah, damages, damages. But as your father, where are those damages going? I don't know. I don't know, but he, that, uh, that's what he was suggesting. Mm, mm. So now the court case continues, and then where did it end up? So it continued... Um, Oh, okay. So 2007, I, I we went to court. He was arrested. He, he went out on bail. So from 2007 until 2011, wow. I was 17 years old. So that's the only time that I went to to stand in court because all the other times we were being we went there and we were told that the cases um, adjourned because of this and that and the other. And it was only in 2011 that I went to court and I spoke out. And do you remember what that was like? Yes, I remember. I was still young, so I was in the intermediary. So there was a woman who was helping me just um, take everything from court and I relay it to me what they are saying in court and I would tell my story and that was it. So just to be clear, uh, you were not speaking directly for yourself because you were a minor at the time? Yes. Yes, yes. okay, okay. <laughs> And, you know, something that just comes to mind is back in the days, um, whenever they'd have children in court that have to speak on rape, some of the tough things that they had to deal with, which I know they still speak about today, when they use things, examples like calling private parts by their actual names, it became a problem because then they would say, we're not sure this child is speaking accurately because they're saying banana and they're not saying penis. Were you actually guided as to how to speak about the rape when you describe it in court? 
yes, I was I was very much guided because every time when we were there, we always thought that maybe the case would be heard today. So I already knew that they had told me, they had trained me to know to to say that I must call everything as it is. I must mm. not call it in any other name. I must just name it that he took his penis and put it in my vagina, you know? Yes. So it was it was just like that. Um, so I was already aware of, of, of what yes. to say. W were you cross-examined at all? Yes, I was, but, um, but, but as I said, it was always relayed to the lady who was with me in the room. So she would, um, she would hear the questions and then she would relay them to me and I would answer back and she would say it back to the court. What was the toughest question that was asked of you by your father's counsel? Um, he asked me, um, what time of day was it the last time he raped me? And it was, I mean, five years later. And I, I just couldn't remember. I couldn't remember. I can't say that it was this day because there was a lot going on. We were also had gone shopping for my clothes mm. and... I can't yeah. remember. It was in the afternoon or early evening or, you know, so that was the toughest question he asked me, but I, I replied back with a clap. And, and I mean, was, do you feel, and I'm, I'm asking this obviously for the many, many rape cases that, that have to go before the courts in the country, do you feel that questions like that actually compromise uh, the cases and could have compromised a case like yours? Yes, um, I, I knew I was told by, by my prosecutor that they will ask you questions so that whatever question that you maybe would say that it was in the afternoon and your dad would say in the evening and now they would be fighting about that and they would never come to a conclusion of what you were yeah. really saying, what you, what you really knew. So if you do not know, just say that you do not know. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's such an important thing to raise because the other, the other version could be that um, he says, uh, uh, you say it was in the afternoon, and he says, actually, in the afternoon, I was getting my hair cut. Here's a receipt to show. Yes, definitely. Mm. Definitely. But I was, I was, I was really, like I said, because it took so many years for mine to be actually be heard, yes. I was uh, already giving me advices as to what to say and what not to say and what to agree on and what not to agree on. Yes. And in this time that the, the court case was happening, were you in therapy? Yes, I was in therapy. Um, there were, they, they, they did provide therapy for me as the court. Um, so yes, I was I was going, but the therapy that they had organized for me was in Umtata and I was based in East London. So there were times that I was not able to go because mm. I, I couldn't afford it at the time. Mm -mm. So now how did the court case uh, finally conclude? Um, after I, I went to court, I told my mom that I'm not dealing with this anymore. I am tired because we've been coming here um, until, until, you know. So I never went there again. Um, but we only heard in 2017 that he was actually arrested, but we never, um, convicted, I mean, but we never heard of um, how many years was it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And how did you find out? Was it, was it the authorities that came and told you? Um, I found out because um, he had done some programs in, in jail and he was ready to confess and apologize. They usually do uh, in prison a victim um, and offender dialogue that we yes. had to go. Uh, yes. Yes. So that is when I actually knew that, oh, okay, he was actually in jail and this is what they needed from me now. So no one contacted you to say this person's been convicted. They're now in prison serving time. You only got contacted to be told that actually he's been in prison and now he would like to make amends. Yes, yes. Did you agree to that request? Yes, I did agree. And I went to see him and I was with my mom and my aunt and he, he, he said all that he needed to say and I was okay with it. What made you agree to, to go and uh, give him that time with you? Um, when they called me and said that he wanted to confess, I, I, I felt that I needed to go and do that because I needed to close that chapter in my life, you know. So that's what made me go and, uh, and listen to what he has to say. And really, he did do that. And I felt that I'm, I'm okay. I'm mm -hmm. okay. Are you comfortable to share what it was he had said when he uh, sat down with you? 
Yes, I am. Um, he just said, um, because we asked him that, um, we don't know why you are here. Um, mm. Maybe it's for something else. Um, so just let us know why are you here and why have you called me? And he he took a very long time to to finally get to his point that he's here because he had raped me as a child, and that he he um, the court found him guilty. But as as he was in in, in jail already in prison, that's when he realized that what he did he really did do it and he was wrong and he wants to apologize for it. Did you believe him that he actually has come to a point of I was wrong? I did believe him, but I think just his actions months later after that, because now we had we had an agreement with his family that in as much as he has apologized to me personally, but I feel like he also needs to apologize to my family at large, you know, because my family now had to move up and down because of me, because of what he has done to me, you know. Mm. So he needs to also apologize to my family. So he never done did that mm. um, up until now. Now he's only reaching out saying that he wants to do that reconciliation again. So I didn't think that, I, I thought at that time he looked sincere that he was actually yeah. saying it, but his actions after that didn't really make me feel that he really wanted to, to be at peace with this. And when you say recently, how recent are we talking? It was probably two months ago that he contacted me and, okay, well, it wasn't him that contacted me, but he asked the authorities to contact me so that he can have a reconciliation with my family. So he's still in prison? Yes, he's still in prison. Do we have a release date? No, not yet. Mm. Not yet. And how are you feeling today? Today I'm feeling okay. I'm feeling okay. I was in um, I was in Umtata this past weekend, and I just felt that um, just seeing the old um, places he used to take me to because I I don't think I've been there ever since mm. that um, that time. So um, I, I I booked in with my psychologist and just to talk about it how I'm feeling and I think just me knowing that one day I I might bump into him in the streets you know um d um does leave something in me so I, I just needed to talk about it but I'm fine now I'm okay. If he were to be watching this show right now, is there something you would want to say to him directly? No, not really. I feel like we have spoken about everything that we. We needed to, I needed to say to him and everything like that. So not really. Mm. And is there anything you'd like to share with viewers at home watching right now? Um, I'd like, I'd just like to, um, to, to a victim going through um, what I have been through that just, it, it, it gets better. I know that you might wake up and uh, some days and you're like, you don't want to get up and do things, but it does get better. You will become something in life. I have written a book about my story and just everything is going well for me now at this moment. But I, I just, w once you decide to close that chapter about your life, really moving on is, is, is doable. Do you feel vindicated um, where you are today? Yes, I do. I do. Um, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but a part of me feels that it does. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. I, do. I do. And lastly, would you say you have forgiven him? Yes, I have forgiven him. Mm -hmm. I have forgiven him because I learned that um, not forgiving him is only setting me back, mm -hmm. you know, and um, unforgiveness is only hurting me and not him. So I decided to, to, to release the pain and the anger and the resentment I have towards him so that I could live a better life of, of having forgiven him. Mm. Zizo, thank you so much for talking to us today. I know that you've, you know, laid your story out in a book of which we will uh, share the details with our viewers. Uh, but also, you know, speaking about it, I know it takes so much courage and bravery having to relive such a trauma that you went through, um, you know, being raped by your own father and then conceiving a child because of it as a teenager, not even knowing what was happening to you. I, I commend you and I'm just so appreciative that you can share your story with those watching. Um, somebody might be going through what you went through that doesn't even know what it is, but by virtue of the fact that they're hearing your story, 
um, hopefully they can come out and have the type of outcome you did, which is that the person is now behind bars. All right. Thank you so much, Sislenu. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zizo. These discussions are not easy, but even worse is having to live the reality. If this is something you are going through, I encourage you to speak out. Hopefully more people can be put behind bars. We know that convic conviction rates in our country can be extremely discouraging, but rape is wrong, whoever it is that is the perpetrator. And to all of the victims, we believe you. Let's continue the conversations. Thank you so much for joining us on Unpacked. Have a good night. Next time on Unpacked. My first criminal activity, I stole 200,000. Was there nothing in you that said, don't do this? The more I stay here, it's the more I'm going to steal. Your kids thought you guys were overseas and you were both in jail. Unpacked with Rilebukhile Maboja. New episodes weekdays at 5.30 p.m. on my YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. Television edited broadcasts weekdays at 5 p.m. Open up to S3.